Eastern. Liftoff. We have liftoff at 9.34 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The tower is clear. And we have a roll program. Pleasure. Precisely on schedule, 9.34 a.m., Apollo 15 lifted from the pad on its way to the moon. And we have a pitch program. Roger. With the exception of a few minor problems, the trip out would be uneventful. The command module Endeavour, carrying the lunar module Falcon, would arrive in lunar orbit with Scott's announcement. Hello, Houston. The Endeavour is on station with cargo, and what a fantastic sight. Oh, this is really profound. I'll tell you, this is absolutely mind-boggling up here. Gentlemen, I can well imagine that a foreign planet must be a weird thing to see. July 31st, after a night's rest, Dave Scott descended into the lunar morning. Okay, Houston, as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I sort of realize there's a fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. And this is exploration at, at its greatest. Scott was then joined by Jim Irwin. Oh boy, it's beautiful out here. Reminds me of Sun Valley. Their first job was to get the lunar roving vehicle out of its storage bay. Looks like she's coming down okay. Jim? Up, up. That looks good. Boy, is this dirt soft. Like soft powder snow. Next, the astronauts tried out the rover. During this test drive, one failure showed up. The rover was designed to steer through both its front and rear wheels. In use, the absence of front wheel steering would hardly be noticed. Then they loaded the equipment they would need for their geological survey and boarded the rover for their first exploration. Okay, we're moving forward, Joe. Roger. They were headed toward St. George Crater, located on a mountain slope above Hadley Rill to the south of the landing site. There would be a stop to collect samples at a smaller crater called Elbow, then arrival at the base of St. George, and a look into Hadley Rill. Oh, look at that. Oh, look back there, Jim. Look at that. That's yeah. beautiful. That is spectacular. This is unreal. The most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Scott then adjusted the television antenna on the rover. A quarter of a million miles away, in Houston's mission control, a flight controller operated the television camera mounted on the rover. Scientists and engineers on Earth could directly monitor the lunar exploration. And those of us at home watching on television felt like the third astronaut on the moon. That looks fairly recent, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure does. Okay, now we got the fillet, we got the soil, now we need to sample the rock. The astronauts began to collect samples and photograph the area. The samples would consist of rocks picked up with a rake-like device, soil samples, selected rocks, and chips taken from boulders. Can you imagine that, Joe? Here sits this rock, and it's been here since before creatures roamed the sea on our little Earth. They would also drive core tubes into the lunar soil to collect contiguous specimens from beneath the surface. But now it was time to return to the lunar module. Not to end this first work period on the lunar surface, but to begin another phase. I can't believe uh, we came over those mountains. 
After returning to the LEM to load equipment, they moved to a nearby location to set up a science station similar to those left on previous missions. With the establishment of these experiments, a network of scientific stations was achieved which would allow triangulation of events and give us the ability to locate precisely the origin of lunar events. As they worked, one of their instructions was to throw the packings as far as possible from the site. Dave Scott. I'll give you a demonstration here, Joe. Roger, right on here, Joe. Spectacular demonstration. Oh, well, enough of that. Lovely. What was that a demonstration of, by the way? It started out to be of gravity, and it wound up being of a centrifugal force, I think. Using an electric drill, Scott sank a tube into the lunar soil into which a probe would be placed to measure heat flow in the lunar material. The difficulty in drilling would delay placement of the second probe until the next day. The science station was then activated and Scott and Irwin closed Falcon's hatch on EVA number one. Sixty miles above the moon, Al Warden orbited in the command module Endeavour, operating experiments, his observations adding to the wealth of scientific data already accumulated. Okay, I'm looking right down on Litro now, and a very interesting thing. It looks like a whole field of uh, small cinder cones down here. The detection of cinder cones, clearly of volcanic origin, helped solve another element of the controversy about how much of the moon was formed by volcanoes and how much by meteoroid impact. Warden was operating a series of experiments in the scientific instrument module. These included a mapping camera to shoot lunar features and simultaneously the star field for accurate location of these features, a panoramic camera, a laser altimeter for accurate topographical mapping, and a series of experiments to analyze the chemical makeup of the lunar crust. In the estimation of a number of scientists, this orbital research station would provide the most important information collected during the mission. August 1st, Scott and Irwin prepared for their second day on the moon. And as Scott checked the inoperative forward steering of the rover, Their destination was the base of the Apennine Front. Here they hoped to find some of the basic substance of the lunar highlands. So as we drive uh, up sun here, I can see uh, Mount Hadley, and the linear patterns in it are really remarkable. Then they began the physical sampling of the Apennine Front, stopping at four craters in their traverse. Oh boy. Jimmy, let's go to work. Roger. Look at that. Uh, Almost see twinning in there. Guess what we just found? I think we found what we came for. Crystal rock, huh? Yes, sir. You better believe it. To the untrained eye, it looked like just another rock. But its large crystals, formed in pairs called twinning, showed it to be a section of primal lunar crust formed during the earliest history of the solar system, not obliterated by billions of years of impacts and lava flows. It was a key to many mysteries. Was the early lunar crust molten? Why differences in color and density between the highlands and lowlands? Nicknamed the Genesis Rock, it stands as a major clue in unraveling the formative processes of the moon, the earth, and the planet. 